Without further ado, we're going to talk about pro digital innovation, strategy, process, and governance. So we have uh, Professor Young Jin Yu from uh, Case Western Reserve University's Weatherhead School of Management. Uh, and then we have Professor Ray Henry from the Monte Ahuja College of Business at Cleveland State University. So, Young Jin, you want to come up? Dr. Young Jin Yu is the um, Truhaf Professor of Entrepreneurship and Professor of Information Systems in the Department of Design and Innovation at the Weatherhead School of Management, Case Western Reserve University. He's also the WBS Distinguished Research Environment Professor at Warwick Business School in the UK. His research interests include innovation and entrepreneurship, organizational genetics, societal use of technology, and design. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. So thank you for the invitation. Um, yesterday was my uh, birthday. Uh, yeah. Well, it's, that, that, that's OK. I, I did it yesterday. Yeah, and uh, you don't really enjoy your birthday anymore. Uh, I think that's a sign of aging. So anyway. Uh, um, Many of you probably have seen this quote. Uh, it was uh, posted uh, uh, March 2015. Um, and it says, Uber, the world's largest taxi company, owns no vehicles. Facebook, the world's most popular media owner, creates no content. Alibaba, the most valuable retailer, has no inventory. And Airbnb, the world's largest accommodation provider, owns no real estate. Something interesting is happening. Uh, it is interesting if uh, you're just watching it, if you're a professor and, and commentating about it, if it is really scary if you are one of those companies or you feel like you're one of those companies. And uh, what really uh, is happening here, uh, you can uh, interpret this in many different ways, but the way I look at it is that technology is fundamentally disrupting the business model. Uh, it is describing how people used to make money. So uh, what is digital innovation? Digital innovation, for me, is fundamentally transforming the way value is created and captured uh, in, in, in the economy. And we do so by using digital assets as the core primary source of digital cre uh, value creation. So uh, previous uh, digital uh, innovation is what I would characterize as a paving cow's path. So it is winding road, and we simply use digital technology to make that winding cow's path a little bit better. So the transition to 2G to 3G, or digital TV the way we have it right now, a lot of enterprise IT systems, uh, electronic health record system, fundamentally did not change the way the organizations operate. They follow the same uh, uh, a century old industrial business model where we make stuff, we transform physical assets into a marketable goods and services, and we use technology to make that process a little bit better. Now, the current way of digital innovation, uh, best example uh, is what we call uh, CASE. Uh, it's what is happening in automotive industry. So when you uh, talk to automotive guys, uh, the future of automotive, they use four uh, uh, words, acronym. All right, CASE is connected, A, autonomous, S is, uh, uh, what is S, shared, and then E is electronic. Fundamentally disrupting the way automotive industry has been thinking about the car. And this is one another example. A Tesla has 150 moving parts. A typical internal combustion engine car has about 10,000 moving parts. And none of them overlaps with 150 parts that Tesla use. Now what does this mean is that the, the guys who are working um, at GM and, and Ford have no clue how to set up the supply chain to compete with a Tesla. Because that the people that they used to talk to do not know how to put together the part that goes into the car that Tesla is using. Now, so what I am saying is that digital object, digital asset, is the foundation of value creation. So what does that mean? This is a little bit philosophical because this guy is a philosopher. Uh, he says uh, digital objects are the ones that take shape on a screen or hide in the back end of a computer program composed of data and metadata regulated by the structure or schemas. So why does it matter? Let me give you a concrete example. Which one of these two are real? Right? Now, back in the old days, we, we produced paper, boarding pass. When you purchase a ticket, there is a contract uh, you know, that was made. And then as, as a token of the uh, transaction, uh, they actually produce a real paper, right? mail it to you, and you hold on to it. And then you use that ticket, the, what is left of, to get uh, the reimbursement. Right? The ticket is real, that is produced, 
And then IT folks generate data uh, transaction record that go in, goes into the transaction uh, uh, pr uh, processing system. Not anymore. Neither of them are real here. We do not see the real one here. When e-ticket was uh, created, the concept is that the ticket that the Air, United Air would cre create would never take a physical form. It lives in the cloud. It uh, stays as a non-material digital object. And it remains as such until the moment we decide to convert it into the physical object that I can uh, use to show that I have a seat in the uh, airplane. Some people would do that transaction, what we call printing, into the physical medium called paper at their home. Some others would wait until the very last moment and pull out their phone to use their physical device called phone and their screen, convert their pixels into certain patterns that looks like a picture, looks like a ticket, but it is not really a ticket. It's a temporary printing of non-material object on physical material. That is how we generate value. So what I'm trying to explain here is that digital object, unlike a physical object, has two very fundamental properties that makes us to rethink how we create value. First, they are non-material. Number two, they are computed. What do I mean by non-material? That means because they leaves as non-material objects in the ether of the, uh, the online space, human being cannot interact and, and um, uh, enjoy the digital object. So each time we use digital object, they have to be printed on physical medium, whether it is air, uh, you know, through MP3 file being converted into sound, or uh, your uh, document that you see on piece of paper or Kindle, your smartphone, every data, data a digital object need to be printed on physical um, uh, materials. Your Uber, the passenger, the, the driver and passenger car of someone else's become the physical object that prints taxi service as a digital object in the real world. That's how Uber is operating. So then digital object needs to be computed. What does that mean? Each time you generate digital object onto the uh, physical space, that conversion action has to be done through computation. It requires computation. Therefore, it remains reprogrammable. And then it is a result of pre-formatted, automated, contingent live action done by the algorithm. What do I mean by that? Here's an example. This is a JPEG file. Somebody actually did it. So someone um, saved this file and um, it's open, save, open, save 500 times. And then this is what happened. The software behind JPEG software does what it is supposed to do, compression. Each time you do this thing, and then it changes the content, right? If you have your family photo in your smartphone, you actually do not have photo. What you have is non-material data that will have to be uh, converted into a pattern that looks like your family members that will show up on your screen, right? Now, if Apple decides to change the software that is on your computer to uh, change the rendering of a particular color, it will change without you knowing. Why? Because that action of a printing is a part of a computation. So uh, when you do cut and paste, for example, the physical paper, we use a scissors, cut, paste. You know that document, that the words on that uh, uh, paragraph that you just cut and paste are actually the same words. When you do cut and paste on Word, not the same, right? It is computation that is going uh, through, and it appears as if it is the same, but you never guarantee, right? So. So the, what is the value creation process then? Um, taking this into the value creation. Value creation is the steps and activities within and across firms and industries that lead to the production of marketable goods and services. So uh, why does it matter? This is how we used to think about value creation. We have raw material. This is Michael Porter's value, uh, creating a, a value chain. And then we create a product. At the end of the value chain, we produce product and then we uh, exchange product with money. We have a producer, and then we have a buyer. That's what we have. So um, in this model, product needs to come together at the end of the value chain, but before buyer ever uh, uses it. So this is what I call early and permanent binding of resources to create 
a product that has irrevocable status. Once you produce this clicker, clicker remains as a clicker, and unless you destroy its value. So that clicker is assembled as a clicker at the end of the production, way before I ever get my hands on it. This is what we call early and permanent binding. And then transfer of ownership is ultimate uh, goal of the, uh, the value creation. And information is produced as a byproduct of this physical process. And we use that information to make the process better. And they only think about buyers, not users. Clicker maker do not know what I'm doing with this clicker right now. right? So they only see buyer, best buy, but not Young Jin Yu who's actually using it right now. So uh, these are the first value creation model goes like this, right? You first start with the da uh, data, a digital object, and then you move that into some sort of like a printing process, creating physical manifestation of the digital object in order to produce value at the point of use. In, in this process, you have to bring physical resource to make your data usable, and that is what we call deferred and temporary binding. So instead of doing early binding as manufacturers used to do, what you try to do is you defer that process of bring hardware into the process in your value creating network at the very last minute as much as possible. And in this process, the process that we go through is encoding, uh, aggregating, computing, printing, and sensing. Now traditional entire value chain is now uh, reduced into one step called printing. Right. So the encoding is, you know, we collect data, we, and then uh, sensing and encoding goes together. We collect all this data, we calculate, and then we try to figure out what this person wants to do now, and then we bring these different resources together. So here, the key idea is the movement from uh, early and permanent binding to deferred and temporary binding. Your iPhone is fundamentally different because that one can be anything that you want because depending on the app you have. So the, the moment, one moment, it acts as a, a phone, the next moment it acts as a map, the uh, following moment it acts as a, a, a clock. Why is that? Because it has a temporary and deferred binding of different resources to produce different actions. So the under uh, the digital first strategy, the value co-creation process is on demand, deferred, temporary, and recombinant assemblies of distributed material, uh, material and non-material resources through the live actions by software-enabled instructions. It's a long, convoluted uh, statement. What simply it means is that the companies need to see themselves as a nexus of algorithms. And what it does is knowing where digital assets and physical assets and try to bring these uh, different types of assets algorithmically with a scale uh, real time together on demand so that we minimize the, the production and uh, logistics cost at the minimum. The moment you own physical asset, it is very expensive. The moment you own Fixed cost asset, it is very expensive. So what you're trying to do is minimizing the ownership of any form of physical asset as much as possible. Now this is what digital native companies do naturally. So you can see why non-digital native companies find it extremely difficult to embrace digital innovation because that's not how they think. So, um, so the firm uh, becomes a nexus of algorithms that carry out a printing instruction at or near the point of use for deferred binding. And data and algorithms are the drivers of value creation. Physical resource are combined only when and where it adds value. So as a final example, here's a book, here's a uh, Kindle, right? So a book is published for its final value being the bounded book for transaction of a purchasing. The publisher have no clue what you do with the book. Printing, when you print something on a piece of paper on a screen, the purpose is not storing the paper. The purpose is use what's on the paper to do what you want to do, it's use. And you don't really keep your printed paper on your bookshelf. You throw it away, you recycle it. 
that's where we are in the, the digital uh, uh, innovation space. So final example. When you think about uh, Amazon as a company, right? The store is just a bunch of codes. It's HTML and CSS, so back, uh, you know, back end logic, database, and then uh, style, and the data coming in, creating this website. Uh, each time we visit, Amazon Web Store is printed on your screen. That's how we interact with. Now, from their perspective, going from website to app was a trivial exercise. From here to Alexa or Dash is just another extension of changes in the UX. Now, from here to Amazon Go is just another extension of changing UX. When Amazon went to uh, Amazon Go and now Whole Food, it is not them becoming like Walmart because the, the direction of the logic progression is absolutely opposite, right? They see this whole thing as merely an extension of what they begin as a digital first. Now, unfortunately, when Walmart wants to compete with Amazon here, what they need to do is they need to unwind what they have done and rethink their strategy and come back and compete here. Warby Parker has a physical store, but their physical store is a complementary to their digital first strategy. They did not set up the e-commerce as an extension of their physical uh, business model. They do not have a, a physical business model. The entire operation is non-physical, digital only model, which has physical presence in order to generate value for the company. So uh, we started, Jennifer and I started working on this uh, uh, project called XLab. XLab is a, a consortium of companies coming together in the Northeast Ohio. And our goal is to help companies to make this transition from the traditional physical first value creating process to digital first value creating process. It is heavily driven by technology, but technology is just a piece of it. It is an important part of it, but it is actually mentality, the mindset, the attitude, culture, talent, and most importantly, the, the business model and process that companies have. So we, you need to have a, a business model, you have to have a strat strategic framework, and you need to have a talent. We'd like to focus on three themes, uh, healthy living, manufacturing, B2B, and experience. And uh, just as one last plug, uh, we have a uh, class uh, at the Webhead School uh, on the, with the same title. So if you want to spend more time in a more uh, relaxed manner, um, you can uh, sign up. Thank you.